motion about the UN and maybe you can consider each part of the process of education. The world is filled with atrocious people, dictators who avoid the law and are, are, are left unprosecuted and they run free and cause more damage to this world. And we are all that. Moreover, we think that we, we, if we are all that, stop these individuals from causing more damage. And we think that the only way to stop these individuals is to stand in a force that can take the extra step into, into avoiding these harms in the first place, right? In my speech, I'll present you two arguments. Firstly, why the enforce, why we need the enforcement of the international law through this method. And secondly, why why do international um, bodies hire these individuals in the first place? Or what benefit do they find in hiring these individuals? But before that, let's set up this debate, right? What we think, what perspectives do we think that these uh, mercenaries should be hired in? Firstly, we think that um, elite elite mercenary groups should be cho chosen by uh, chosen by the United Nations or uh, international bodies like NATO, right? So there is no need. Uh, we think that there is no need to fund these uh, these uh, these mercenaries because they are well equipped already, right? So for example, Blackwater, Blackwater, or the Peshmerga forces, right? We think that how the Free Syrian the Free Syrian Army um, hires Peshmerga to fight the Syrian government, right? So these are types of uh, instances. On a, these, are, these are types of instances in the fact where mercenaries do help in the fight against that, uh, that certain dictator, uh, dictator, right? But we uh, we we still have the uh, power. But secondly, we will outsource their yeah, military accountability. We will outsource military accountability to these mercenaries, right? But however, they will still get the orders from uh, from the person in charge, right? That is the UN or international bodies like the NATO. For example, uh, we will give them orders to catch uh, dictators on the run, or uh, and they will carry out things like assassinations or intervention to stop that that, that certain. Uh, the incident damage from happening in the first place. So let's move on to uh, my first argument. Before that, any advice? Okay, thank you. So firstly, why do we need the enforcement of the international law? On the first level, we think that international governing bodies uh, have the uh, responsibility to enforce equality and uh, to report equality on an international scale, right? So that it doesn't matter where it is. But there are certain uh, there are certain barriers to these uh, to, to the enforcement of the law that is carried out by the international bodies like the UN or NATO. So how what are the methods in uh, what are the methods in, in how these international bodies in, enforce the law? And I want to tell you why the, uh, these methods are flawed. So firstly, we think uh, there there are firstly. The UN uh, relies on execution from international courts like the ICC, International Criminal Court, or the International Court of Justice, ICJ, right? But the problem is, is that it only applies to countries that subscribe to, I mean, they subscribe to the International Criminal Court or the U UN as a whole, right? So for countries like Syria and Iran, who don't, uh, who don't subscribe to these other countries, countries that are, uh, in, uh, who, are who are not a part of the non nuclear non group, the, the NPT, basically, right? So they, because they don't subscribe, they don't subscribe to the law that is proposed by the UN. Or Enforcement that is proposed by uh, by the UN. So in the end, uh, are these, are the, uh, these international uh, these international courts don't con con conduct trials when they, when so they don't conduct trials if you if if you are not a part of that of that of that certain uh, of that certain party right or of that certain international go governing body. But moreover, the problem with this, uh, the, another problem with these international courts is that the uh, the these type of international courts don't conduct trials when the criminals are not present. Right? When that certain dictator is supposed to be prosecuted is not present. So, for example, Charles, Charles Taylor, who uses child uh, child soldiers in the Central for African Republic, right? We try to find him. We send peacekeepers in to find him, but we still don't. We still we still we still can't. Uh, we, we still we still couldn't find him, right? So, in in the end. The, it took, it took a long time for us to find him, right? So the conclusion of this example is basically when the, when the criminal is not present, we can't prosecute him, right? And therefore, you extend the uh, the range of damage that these, 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 these dictators can put upon society. The second, the second reason to why um, 
these uh, this, the second method of how these international government bodies enforce the law are by peacekeepers, right? So these peace peacekeepers are basically there to obstruct uh, to obstruct violence, right? So they're not necessarily there to battle the war or to battle or to kill individuals or to kill the enemy within that war. Yeah, they are they are, they are they're basically they're basically there as a bastion of neutrality, right? To stop the war as a whole, to 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 act as a force to into influencing or coercing individuals to lay down their arms. But we think that this is not sufficient. Uh, within within this scenario, right? So, for example, in Rwanda, when we sent in when we sent in peacekeepers, we all know that they didn't work in the first place, right? They still have up there. They still that bad damage. Uh, they still damage being caused, right? So, these peace, even though these peacekeepers are 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 assumed to have certain amount of uh, of a uh, certain amount of power over these uh, these issues, they don't have they don't have the they don't they don't have the the ultimate power because they they are they they are they are they are stopped by the barriers right because they can't commit violence or to to kill is uh, to kill the indicators or the power that is causing the damage within uh, within that certain within that certain country right so the conclusion to uh, the, the conclusion to this is that these methods are not working right and we need a new method to do uh, we need a new method to do so right and we think that the mercenaries are the way to go because replacing these methods we think that mercenaries help self autonomy right and that's the characterization that we pose when when because these uh, these mercenaries are not subject to the uh, the 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 United Nations or the autonomy or order, unless they unless they breach law, right? Obviously, we we do agree that the UN will give them instructions on what to do or uh, on what or what we plan for you to do, but they don't they don't necessarily they don't necessarily force you to do these things, right? The, these mercenaries have their own self autonomy in doing these things. They are they, they are merely they are merely uh, advised by the United Nations in doing these things. So we think that uh, because they have the self autonomy, they have more power into stopping these uh, into stopping these dictators uh, from uh, causing damage anymore, and we think that intervention can, I mean, is most likely to be guaranteed uh, within this scenario. So the conclusion is argument is that militaries provide a better platform to enforcing the law within international state. My second question, very quickly, why do international bodies hire these uh, type of these uh, these mercenaries? <laughs> so firstly, we think that these mercenaries are voluntary, right? So there is they think that because they are voluntary, there is a less need to risk the lives of many individuals, right? So, for example, the U.S. doesn't want to send uh, individuals. Uh, the U.S. doesn't want to send uh, people to ISIS, so they instead they, they they just send help, right? They only send uh, they only send like bombers there to to stop ISIS as, as a whole. So they realize that there is a risk into uh, there is there is there is a, you risk the lives of people when you send them there. Secondly, we think there's efficiency because the soldiers are uh, uh, make up uh, the soldiers make up a hierarchy that still exists within these scenarios. So they still follow order, but they have their own economy into enforcing law. For all those reasons, we think that is the we think that these mercenaries, the mercenaries provide a bastion of neutrality into stopping the damage that is caused by these atrocious powers. <laughs> If peace is so important a goal to to eradicate all these crimes against humanity and we want to achieve peace, then why are we using a crime against humanity to tear down everything the UN stands for? Right. So um, the opposition side today would like to first um, say who they want to protect. We want to protect the civilians who are innocent, the people in this con uh, in the countries that the mercenaries are going to, uh, you know, um, exterminate their uh, dictators or 
you know, uh, eliminate so-called oppression. So we want to protect these civilians um, because they are under the oppression of some force. And uh, we, we think this is bad and harmful to them, and we, we like to protect them. But I'd like to elaborate on how later in my speech. But first of all, I'd like have, I have one rebuttal against uh, the government side, and uh, that that they said that um, we we oh, we don't want to waste lives because we see that there is a risk. Uh, in like they gave an example of the U.S. when they bomb when they try to bomb ISIS, they said that they recognize that there is a risk in these things, and we don't want to waste lives by sending uh, you know like military and things like that but but <laughs> this is my rebuttal you may not waste lives of the people whom you're you like the the military who are so-called bombing isis in your example but you will waste civilian lives because of the callousness of mercenaries uh, which which i will characterize later okay so um my first argument is that the un um and they to fight for peace and they're going against everything that they stand for which is even more detrimental to their cause of peace sit down so um, I'd like to um, say a little bit about mercenaries. So if you say that, oh, okay, these, these people in, in countries are being oppressed by terrorists, dictators and stuff. So if you send mercenaries in, what different, how, how different are they from these people who are oppressing um, the, the people in, inside the country? So you and the, the UN or NATO, whoever sends these mercenaries will be seen as bad as the terrorists because they are using violence they're using a crime against humanity to fight against the oppression um, that, that, that are faced by the people. Sit down, sit down. At this point. So I'd like to give an example of Bashar al-Azad um, in, in Egypt. He used the people's uh, riot against the government. He used like, the people's uh, uprising against the government as an excuse to fight back and oppress the people like, even more. So what, what do you get from this example? We get that violence is not the answer. Crime against humanity cannot, like, like terrorism, cannot be uh, fought with another crime of humanity because two wrongs don't make it, right? And we'll explain why. So yes, we concede, no, no, sit down uh, after this. We concede that okay, maybe the UN has like, failed last time. Maybe the UN has some flaws that, and 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 maybe these uh, international governing bodies has had some flaws. But we we uh, like to say that under your paradigm, it will be worse because you tear the ability to have diplomatic relations down by actually having these mercenaries in which. Um, I'll explain why later, because you cannot fight a crime against humanity against uh, something of its own nature. Yeah, you are not arguing against military, you are arguing against execution of war as opposed to that every scenario. Yeah. No, no, uh, I, I, I am arguing against mercenaries and, and here is why, okay? This is the likely scenario that's going to happen. So, who are mercenaries in the first place, okay? So, mercenaries are people who come in and you know, they are advised by the UN and NATO to get a job done and exterminate some, some person or the other and with, with guns blazing to, in hopes of eradicating their target and achieving their goal and okay, they go home. They don't have any personal attachment to that country itself. They don't have a personal attachment to the civilians inside the country. They don't have a personal attachment to the property inside the country. All they need to do is just because they're advised by the UN, they just kill, go home and yeah, they get a job done, peace it down. So, what do these mercenaries do? They, okay, we, we concede to our characterization of mercenaries that they're self-sufficient and they, they don't need to be funded because, you know, um, they don't need to be funded because they're self-sufficient. But what will happen? This is a very likely scenario that, that will happen, okay? So they, they, they don't care about the damage to property of civilians because, I mean, what? I mean, why why should they? So, because they are a crime against humanity, and they want to um, dis they want to come in with hopes of uh, exterminating di dictators and destroying the 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 oppression that these civilians face. So this is very detrimental to the civilians because they are innocent people. And so and and I like to like answer this question. So what if they kill innocent civilians? They okay. So picture this. Okay, they come in. The mercenaries come in. Okay, UN invites them. All right, can you come in and exterminate this? This so and so, this this terrorist group that is terrorizing the people right now. So they come in, they, in the process of exterminating this terrorist group, a lot of innocent lives will be lost. People who who are being oppressed and they didn't even do anything wrong against against these um against well, uh, NATO or UN and and they get killed. So this has a severe impact on the UN and NATO's cause of peace. How how do you achieve peace by you know exterminating one dictator and killing like a few thousand civilians, innocent civilians along the way? So I we think that this is the make sense. And what is the biggest harm here is that innocent people be killed and lives are so carelessly wasted because of the UN's poor decision to just 
uh, invite mercenaries to come in and, and to get the job done for them. So, how? How? Um, this, 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 okay, what, what is the outcome of my argument? Is that again, these mercenaries will kill innocent people, damage infrastructure, and we don't think that it's under the constitution of the UN or the NATO that these mercenaries should be, should be hired to get a job done because of the uh, careless and the callous ways of lives, okay? So, we like to, the opposition side would like to propose an alternative. What is our alternative? Uh, well, I believe that the government uh, has mentioned that, oh, okay, we, we send like peacekeepers, like the military, but they act as bystanders, and but they're not exterminating the power that is causing the damage, I, I quote. So, so what we can do is that, like, like the USA, so, like, you know, the US, they send people, they send the military to like monitor peace in Afghanistan, but instead of of monitoring peace in, uh, in, in these sort of countries, the military instead will be um, helping to eradicate the power that is oppressing these people. So the, uh, so the mercenaries won't have to do this job. We think that the military is a better alternative because they are trained people who are there to minimize casualties while doing their job in the first place. So um, we can, instead of having them act as peacekeepers, we can also have them to eradicate the power that is causing this oppression. So we believe that it's um, better in that sense for these civilians because the military will have um, some sort of, um, you know, standards. By, if we train them with a higher efficiency, if we improve the general condition of how the military works, we believe that this is a better alternative compared to the mercenaries. So uh, I'd like to rest my case. Thank you. <laughs> Mercenaries might be callous. They might have no personal attachments towards the people in the houses they raid. They might have no personal attachments towards the buildings they take down in the countries that they invade. But neither does the military which the US executes into Afghanistan, neither, neither does the military that France executes into Mali. The overarching point is, side a government is arguing against intervention in itself, because no matter who does this intervention, casualties will happen. But the point becomes, it's a comparison of peace after these dictators are taken down, or peace that can never be facilitated for the individuals that live in these countries when their rights are forsaken, when they are being sprayed by sarin gas by Bashar al-Assad and the troops that he enforces. But even if that isn't enough, even if we cannot compare mercenaries towards the military personnel that they want to talk about, mercenaries also have an added reputation towards their own abilities. That means the US will not continue to hire black water if they continue to violate international law or they continue to do inhumane things towards the borders that they try to guard, towards the individuals that try to cross these borders. But even if mercenary groups are accountable to the UN, and being accountable to the UN means they're accountable to the same laws that other militant groups are accountable towards. We will not only fire these groups if they do things that are mis- and we will not only fire them if they mis uh, misuse and abuse the power that we give them. We will also prosecute these individuals if they do things that are already inhumane and not under the Geneva Convention when it comes to wars. So we don't see a contention from side opposition. They need to prove to us why mercenary groups are distinct from military operations, which alter the possibility of all these things happening. Crossfires do happen in military operations. People do die in military operations, but it's all worth fighting for. So that brings me to my second question. Should we limit an intervention on the possibility of safety, on the possibility of peace? Because wars need to be eventual. Because even if wars do obstruct peace for a certain period of time, peace can never be fulfilled in places like Rwanda, where oppression goes to the minority continuously and they cannot live their lives at the end of the day. Peace cannot be peace cannot happen in places like Kobani when ISIS continues to stone individuals who don't subscribe to Sharia, who don't subscribe to Sharia law. Peace cannot happen when China continues to oppress individuals in the minority within the off course of the islands. We don't see how peace can be obtained 
within these circumstances. And we don't see how peacekeepers will function. Because from the Prime Minister's speech, we told you peacekeepers only react towards negativity. They means you can only execute peacekeepers when violence happens, when mass rapes happen. That is when we can only execute peacekeepers. So when they are there to prevent even more harm from happening. They cannot prevent that damage from happening. It has already happened. We can't even bring these individuals to courts because they continue to hide in other countries and they flee away. And the UN does not have a permanent army to take down these individuals. Countries like Iran and Syria do not subscribe and signify the Roman statute, so they can't be prosecuted under the ICJ. What is the alternative under side opposition's case? We do not see how this atrociousness will end under their paradigm. Dictatorship will continue to happen, and that is the peace that they are fine with, the peace that limits the rights of the few and tries to protect the rights of the many. With regards to that, I'll move on to two arguments. One, why international peace should be a shared responsibility and not a unilateral one. But secondly, how this pushes forward the international goals of the UN and how having a mercenary group allows the UN to redirect forces towards other sectors of its international governing body. So first, why international peace should be a shared responsibility? Fulfilling international peace should be a responsibility that is not unilateral. Meaning, in status quo, we don't see our uh, international peace is executed anyone apart from the US. When the US does it as a unilateral intervention in places like Afghanistan, when they take upon that role, when China and Russia continue to veto out interventions, when China and Russia continue to veto out interventions, by NATO, we know this is unfair. One, because considering these unilateral interventions are less effective and more likely to be prolonged. I mean, the casualties that this other house wanted to talk about will be more likely to happen under their paradigm, when the US has limited funding, limited resources, and only so much that they can do. As comparison to mercenary groups coupled with these forces, when they go into these areas, they have more of an ability to bring peace, more of an ability to cripple dictatorships under these circumstances. But secondly, countries are painted as having malicious intent, or countries are painted as having bad motive when they go into these areas. Like we blame the US when, we, when they try to attack Iraq. We blame the US when they try to bring peace within Iraq. We think that this is unfair to these nations in particular because when they try to carry upon that role of bringing peace, they get bad reputations or they get bad criticisms from other nations in itself. But, but thirdly, countries that do have that obligation don't do anything to protect their own economical interests and to protect their own interests for the purpose of their nation. Then why are they uh, bastions of neutrality? Why are these countries, countries that fulfill peace and aim to try to bring peace worldwide? We don't see so. What happens under our paradigm? When we pay mercenaries, it becomes a collective rep representation of the UN. It becomes something that all countries fund because it's something that we can rely upon and it's something that's executed by more than one nation. It also results into several outcomes. A is an enabler for more involvement by other nations. Other nations like France are more likely to have more bombings when they are confident that other that there are there is more than one nation participating within a war. We think that this is much better because it creates a more effective war, a war that is uh, has lesser uh, casualties because the aim is achieved quicker. But second, uh, we think that multilateral invasions as a whole is also better. But third, it reduces burdens on these countries in particular. We think US should have that ability and should have that much because they should be able to take a certain amount of funding and redirect it towards the protection of their own people within their own nation. That cannot happen when we rely on the US to facilitate peace within Afghanistan and Russia and China stand by and do nothing. Where we can pay mercenary groups, the US redirect funding towards protecting their own nation from terrorism and protecting their own nation and their own people. But second, how does this achieve the goal? the goals of the UN. A, within time sensitivity is much better achieved under our paradigm. Under their paradigm, even if some form of intervention or some form of action is taken at the end of the day, it will be too long. And the breach and the crimes against humanity and the crimes against the UN will double or triple. And this is not a trade-off that we're willing to make. But the second level and the final, it allows us to reallocate resources and focus towards other sectors of the UN. The UN does not need to wholly look forward to global peace when they can move forward to other sectors like UNICEF, the like UN and their, and their per, uh, process of immigration or other sectors within the UN. This is something they should be able to do, but they can't do under our paradigm because there's too much of a breach of the international law and too much of a breach of human rights and a violation of human rights. It allows the UN to be more effective and direct re resources because they can outsource their powers towards other missionary groups.
ね。Want the same thing. We want to help innocent lives. We want to stop oppression. We want to make sure that the people on the ground in status quo are fine. We want to make sure they're not killed. We want to make sure they are not oppressed. All of us in this room have a common goal. And today in my speech, I'm going to show you exactly why we on side opposition achieve it better. And they didn't truly explain to you and didn't even barely justify what they have been saying. So firstly, before I move on to my substantives, I would like to answer a few of your concerns. Firstly, they told us that we need to enforce international law, and the best way to enforce international law is through these mercenaries. First, first uh, level is that it goes against the foundation that the UN has been built on. The UN has been built on a peaceful foundation, whereby we rely on diplomacy to solve world issues so that oppression doesn't continue and oppression doesn't worsen. Because at the end of the day, when we do this to government, when we say, hey government, we're going to intervene in your country and we're actually going to try and kill you. Oppression is going to get worse. People, they're they going to say, hey, look, since these people are causing me so much trouble, why don't I give them more trouble? Why don't I do this? And before I move on, yes, sir. So, the UN is based on diplomacy at least. Why do we have UN as votes and vetoes to try to intervene in countries during conflicts? Uh, please repeat that. So, we do have vetoes and voting systems that are employed by the United Nations as a method of intervention into countries. So, the UN does intervene sometimes, it's not all about diplomacy. So, but we intervene in a peaceful way and we don't use mindless mercenaries who go around just based on what they think and start shooting people because at the end of the day, we need to understand the psyche of these mercenaries. These mercenaries are people who kill, who want to just get the job done. They don't care about civilian life. And I'll answer that later about how exactly the military uh, achieves this goal better. So as I was saying, right, a uh, second level, it's principally against international law because international law is to make sure that we achieve goals and achieve um, the answer to oppression in the most peaceful way possible, in the best way possible, with the least lives lost. And we tell you that when you hire mercenaries, when you hire these people to come in their guns blazing, saying, hey, I'm going to kill these people, I'm going to kill... Killing and violence becomes the answer to everything and they are not going to care about whether or not they kill civilians because at the end of the day, if they kill this one dictator and they kill 500 civilians or thousands of civilians, they don't care because according to them, they got their job done. And what did they want to talk to you about? They wanted to tell you that there'll be peace sit down, sir. They wanted to tell you that they'll be prosecuted under the law yeah. as normal. But you see, the problem with this is we don't care because even if they're prosecuted under the law, if they already kill someone, we don't care because they kill people and we're not going to take the risk of sending in people who might kill innocent civilians even more. We tell you this is even worse. Please sit down, sir. I'm not going to answer your PR yet. Thank you. So let's answer their next concern, right? They wanted to tell us that, oh, mercenaries are so much better because they can make decisions based on their personality, based on their self-autonomy, and they can conduct better law. These were the exact words brought up by them. And let me tell you why this is so wrong, right? Firstly, we think that the fact that they base decisions of their self-autonomy is wrong because we think that it's not supposed to be about them, it's not supposed to be based on their personality. International law is, be, is supposed to be upheld based on justice, based on right, not based on your own personality and what you think is right and your arbitrary arbitrary way of looking at things of right and wrong. Before I move on, yes sir, this is my last question. Why would they kill innocent civilians if that means good fight? Sir, we tell you that at the end of the day, when mercenaries go in there, when random individuals go in there, whether or not they're elite, elite, sorry, they want to go in there and they only care about killing the dictator. In their mind, it's not a, a goal, it's not the primary goal to make sure civilians are safe. That's not their primary primary goal. And that in itself is something that we cannot accept. We cannot accept that people going in there trying to stop oppression, the, uh, to stop oppression, those people's primary goal is not to save civilians, it's not to help civilians. We think that this is a major problem that they never wanted to talk to you about, they never wanted to address, right? So, um, um, so now I would like to tell you exactly why they never took down my Prime Minister's points and they didn't do anything to it, right? So our alternative was strengthening the army. And they came up and told you, oh, if you do this to the army, there'll be casualties. How can you guarantee to us that the army will not have casualties? 
Firstly, an army is deputized by a country, by a country as a whole. Mercenaries are individuals who take orders from themselves. And the, all the UN can do is advise and give uh, and give orders. But we tell you that mercenaries may not obey the orders simply because they think that they are individuals that can do whatever they like. But the army is a force, a, a trained force, trained by individuals in the army who have done this job, who have saved civilians, to do that job of saving civilians. So we tell you, it doesn't make sense when they come up here and tell you that there's going to be as much casualties in the army. They never justify to you why there would be as much casualties in the army, right? And also, they come, came up and told you that my Prime Minister and our bank find the dictatorship and peace is fine on our side. No, we are more likely to solve the problem with diplomacy. We are more likely to solve the problem when we don't bring in random people coming in with guns blazing, trying to shoot people, not caring about citizens. The government is going to be angry. The government is going to say, hey, you are trying to do this to me. You are trying to take over the sovereignty of my country. Okay, and you want me to be nice to you and you want me to help the people that you think I'm oppressing. No, please sit down. I've already accepted two of your POIs. So now I'd like to move on to my, uh, to my only substantive of this debate. Firstly, why at the end of the day we need to maintain the sovereignty of a country and why it is so harmful if we don't? Firstly, when it's interfering with sovereignty, okay, when it's a war crime, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the bomb on the civilians, it costs radiation, we consider this a war crime. Secondly, a crime against humanity, the genocide in Rwanda, we consider this a crime against humanity. Firstly, we think that they never really told you in, in what instances they are going to intervene with mercenaries. But also, even if the oppression is a crime against humanity, we think that you shouldn't com combat a crime against humanity with a crime against humanity. Because it's most likely going to be a crime against humanity when you bring in these mercenaries, when, an, when, a government, when an international governmental body recognizes random individuals coming in and using violence as the answer. We think this is even more harmful when you come in and you intervene the sovereignty of a of a government, right? Because we tell you that even if the reasons the reason the mercenaries came in is to combat a crime against humanity, you can't counter it with another crime against humanity. So the harm is the government will get angry, the oppression will increase because you're basically it's as if you're uh, it's an act of war. You're basically saying I'm going to send my troops to come in, guns blazing, and you should defend yourself. So we tell you this is extremely harmful on the other side, and they never justify to you on the other side. And for all these reasons, we take this a bit. Thank you. In the wake of higher breaches against international order, such as democracy deficit in Burma and Thailand, human rights abuses on a historic scale in Syria and Nigeria, and belligerent states like North Korea and Iran, who threaten the world with nuclear power, the one constant in all of these problems is the inaction of the United Nations, the inaction of international governing bodies, an inaction due to inability. From side government, we want to outsource the ability to mercenaries to bring back the benefits. From opposition, all you do is not only do you prolong the benefits, but you reduce the possibility of us ever achieving them. In my speech today, I'll ask three questions. And you know, all responses will be in those three questions as well. First question Will mercenaries damage the safety of people? And there are three reasons why they won't. The first reason. It is unfair for them to accuse mercenaries alone as being the only perpetrators of war crime when they themselves are very guilty as well. Because it wasn't mercenaries that raped civilians in Vietnam, it was the US troops. It wasn't mercenaries that failed as peacekeepers in Rwanda, it was the UN's faulty decision that caused no outcome at the end of the day. But as Kishan said, mercenaries are profit driven. Therefore, they are less incentivized to make mistakes, which means losing money. But they are also hired for a purpose. Therefore, if their purpose is to assassinate Pasha al-Assad, they're not going to assassinate every Tom, Dick, and Harry before they get to his house. They don't work like that, because then they lose money, they lose revenue. But the second reason why mercs do not damage the safety of people, we think the military is a worse off option. Because the military is effective. The military is crippled by leaders who are reluctant to send their troops into these interventions. Leaders fear their troops not coming back. Leaders who fear no support coming from civilians in their country. That's why they don't go. Or, even if you don't want to send their troops, 
they do, if they do want to send their troops, then they can't go because of the painfully long process that takes for you to make a decision that prolongs the war even more. But the military, if you do send it in, still goes in under the banner of a Western intervention. We want to remove that spread of a neutrality. So we go in in the base to want to fight for people, but not to fight for the West. And the final reason why mercenaries don't aim at climate society. And that even if they aren't accountable, the worst case scenario, we just hire a bunch of dicks. We think that the safety of people should be decided by the people. Therefore, if we can reduce how long the war goes on, if we can reduce how long the war goes on, then it means we reduce the amount of people, women, and children exposed to the harms of these wars. We can reduce the amount of people caught in crossfires. If the mercenaries can get a more effective solution, then we can get a much more safer community. We increase the sphere of protection due to an active engagement. The conclusion is mercenaries do not damage the safety of people, instead, they do what your side failed to provide. Before I move on, yes. Your side comes to the fact that they make decisions of their own self autonomy. So don't you think that it's much more likely that they're going to kill civilians if they make decisions of the arbitrary way of what's right and wrong? But they also make decisions based on what they were hired to do. Therefore, if they were hired to kill Bashar al-Assad, then they can't really kill civilians in that area. Because we hire them to prevent a further breach of the Geneva Convention. We hire them to prevent a further breach of the Roman statute. So in doing so, they can't fulfill that job by furthering to breach the Geneva Conventions and Roman statute. Then we probably hired the wrong people, and that's not our fault. It's a fault of someone who's making really bad decisions. The second question. Is this untrue to the goals of the UN? The only way we can win this issue is if we prove that this is a really a monster of war crime, the reasons why we're intervening. With this logic, with the logic that sending people in will bring harms, it's an argument against intervention as a whole. Yeah, yeah. However, we can't only just sit back and watch the situation gets worse. Because believe it or not, the situation is getting worse. When 7,000 women and children are abducted by Boko Haram in Nigeria, that's a problem. When over 8,300 Yazidis face discrimination in Syria or genocide, that's a problem. But what the UN does is, we don't send in troops. We wait for the problem to dilute to make sense, where we can engage through discussion. If we don't win now, if we don't, if we don't send any form of aid, you're screwed. That's what we do by sending mercenaries in. And this also proves why there's a necessity for sending them in from that's answering your question. But the second thing, on self-autonomy, we think the self-autonomy we provide to them that makes them more efficient by not always having to listen or wait out the long processes of UN discussion, does adhere to international law. And here's why self-autonomy equates to you being able to fulfill international law. One, you engage in a time-sensitive situation that's removing the need for the problem to escalate and more countries being involved that's having more countries damaged. Two, you protect the sanctity of life. You can protect more citizens that's preventing more war crimes from happening, and that does adhere to an international law, whatever things that the UN fights for. And finally, we punish those who are wrong. We can't always, no, thank you, we can't always bring back Al-Assad, Charles Taylor to court because they're running away from the courts. Therefore, we need to capture them, to bring them to the court. Or, you know, just shoot them in the dead. So it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing that your side gives us. Or even if it is something pretty bad. But finally, on the final thing, is this untrue the goals of the UN? Will we forever burn the bridges between us and another country if we intervene in Iran? Well, what the hell did you think would happen if US intervened in Iran anyways? I don't see Iran being really willing to engage in discussion right after we kill their leaders. So you still don't provide to us any exclusive benefit from your side. But the reason why we think our benefit is better is because it's not our own states that are directly involving these situations. Yeah, it's yeah. mercenaries that we hire. In doing so, we can outsource the ability of the states to act towards these mercenaries without having to prove direct accountability towards the UN or direct accountability towards these other states. Then giving us the ability to act as a neutral, foreign, good party. Which leads to my final question. Will this increase participation from the international community? Few reasons why. One, it will not be easy for them to multitask as the war goes on. Something spoken about by our first two speakers. They now have more of an ability to act on other things when the war happens because they don't have to focus all their power and attention towards the army. This gives them time to think of both what they are. But second, that neutrality allows countries to still engage diplomatically. We don't completely cut off ties with Iran or North Korea or Syria once the war is done. 
once these mercenaries get their job done, get paid and they're done, we can come in after that and we can talk to them. We can build back from them. And finally, it prevents resentment towards the West. We don't go in as the US, we go in as a neutral, anonymous party. Mr. Speaker, we can see to the fact that both sides of the house agrees to peace of people on the ground. All we don't agree is that they're using mercenaries, which my whole badge already told you about, mercenaries who kill for only money. Mercenaries are people who are money incentivized, only think about money, and lose their rationality when it comes to money. They brought us some things about housing people. If they do these things, they'll prosecute and they will not pay them. But in the event that they actually go to their target, in the event that they actually meet their target of killing the perpetrator or, or, or capturing the person they want to bring to court, um, we, we tell you that they, they wouldn't care. The rationality isn't there, even if they kill people, because they already made the target their uh, sole purpose of the mission. Right? We tell you that all these other things wouldn't matter to them because they'll get paid anyways, because they already caught the people who they want to. They, they, they want to catch, right? That's, that's what their whole case falls then. In my research, I'm going to do, do two things. I'm going to, um, sorry, I'm going to do two things. Firstly, I'm going to prove all the principal uh, fallacies which they brought up, the whole uh, three years. Secondly, I'm going to bring up the issues in this way. Two issues which are, firstly, who achieves more peace? Secondly, the sanctity of life, which they want to talk about. Now, what principal fallacies did they bring up? Like, firstly, they brought up um, about how people are um, that the people that um, the sorry the, the mercenaries are uh, money incentivized and they will not fund them in their first speaker. The contradiction there, they won't fund them. And until the last speaker said and Kishan, they told out they said that they would pay them if they would do uh, they would they do the job properly. Right? They said they would not fund them, and uh, um, the, the consistency wasn't there in the, in the whole case. Right? That's how it falls. And they also didn't tell us how they're gonna choose the elite so-called elite mercenaries that they're gonna uh, bring up to choose to kill the person, to kill the perpetrator or to catch the target, right? We tell you that the case falls because they, they never approved us, never justified, never substantiated anything, any proof on how they're gonna do it, how how they're gonna um uh, how are they going to prove that these people are actually qualified? That these people won't, um, won't fall under the category that I just proved just now that they are too money incentivized, specialty wouldn't be there in the first place. Before I move on to my other principal fallacies and impure ones. We don't need to fund these organizations, they are self funded. We pay them for fulfilling a specific cost. And if they harm people, then they won't get paid. So why is it so confusing? No, because, like, because they think that if they actually um, achieve the goal, achieve the target, then they would they would also get in as well. Because for example, I was here to kill a uh, and, and, and I had to go through Sid to um, go to Kishin. I will kill Sid, and my target is to kill uh, to get Kishin here, right? Because um, people uh, don't have rationality to think because they want the target at hand, right? They want Kishin. They don't care about Sid, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's that's what the reality is, right? The speaker will tell you that's how they think. That's how people, mercenaries who go on gun leading, think, right? That's how they. That's how the whole case falls. And now let me move to my my two issues. First issue: who achieves more peace entirely? They brought up some. Uh, they brought up a lot of um, ideas about through the whole casing, how people they have no connection. Secondly, how peacekeepers wouldn't be good, and they can rely upon uh, mercenaries to do so, right? Few responses. Firstly, I'm going to tell you the nature of peacekeepers. Peacekeepers are people, as my whole bench already said, already rebutted to pe people who uh, are militaries, either militaries or people, a group of people who uh, sustain peace in the country. Right? I tell you, peacekeepers are people who are reliable. We already, uh, time and time again, a lot of peacekeepers, a lot of examples of military go there and they just sustain peace. If anything happens, if anything happens, anything. A violence happens, they will um, they will intervene, right? They will intervene on the uh, violence and prevent the violence from happening more, right? We tell you also prove to you how um nature of mercenaries are mercenaries are people who are money incentivized. They go around harming innocent people, go around harming uh, the, the um the, the buildings and they don't care about the civilians, right? We also told you the diplomacy of the UN. The of the UN is that people uh, this whole policy um 
betrays the whole constitution of UN, right? You have to make peace. Um, my first speaker is against Victoria Irritate. 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 Militaries are people who are trained to do uh, certain things. For example, Navy SEALs. They are people who are trained years and they are they're trained to protect the country, protect the uh, United States, right? These people are not the same as mercenaries. Mercenaries are a group of people who have guns. Who have guns and are only money incentivized, not thinking about the people on the ground, not, not thinking about people who are, uh, who are in, in risk of being killed by them, right? We tell you, um, the distinct difference is people who are trained and people who are not trained. That's how the whole case falls, right? Now, how uh, and and we also tell you that with mercenaries and with um sorry with mercenaries and with militaries, less lives are lost. This is how we how stay peace, right? Less lives are lost because these people won't go around killing people. This will, these people will target people who are already who are also um who are, who are targeted because they aren't money incentivized. They are people who want to protect uh, protect peace because they're trained to do so, right? Before six any PYs. No, all right. We will prove, we will, uh, and my whole case, we will prove you know, about, how, about the army. Now, let me move to my second issue. Second issue is how uh, the sanctity of life, right? The sanctity of life is that people, um, the purpose of the UN, the whole purpose, I'm going to repeat to you the purpose of the UN. The purpose of the UN is to sustain the peace in, in, in the United Nations, right? The peace in the United Nations. The peace is just to keep the peace and not to kill people any way you want. The whole uh, government, government, government is trying to tell you that the UN is there just to kill people, kill, um, just. The narrative that you, the government is trying to bring up to you is that when they uh, hire these mercenaries, they, they bring them there and they will uh, simply kill them because they are uh, already proved to already very money incentivized and they wouldn't have the, ra the rationality to think about other things. This is why the whole case falls. I already proved to you how, firstly, um, the peace will be sustained on our side by using peacekeepers, militaries, and also on their point on how the time sensitivity is a thing, right? We tell you that time sensitivity is, yes, we are, it's a thing, but people there who are said that they will act firstly, right? They, they, they will act um, whenever they see something wrong, right? Um, on, on their self autonomy too, because they think this is, this is, this is not right, right? Um, which is very, completely different to mercenaries. Mercenaries kill people to get to their target, as my analogy I gave you just now. With all these reasons, go to opposition. Thank you. Sitting here for the past hour, so I've been listening to side government trying to prove exactly why mercenaries um, are better, if not the same as mili uh, the military. That's the whole point because at the end of the day, the question in this debate is who can solve this problem better. So we've already told you that mercenaries, and they even considered the fact, they even stated that mercenaries act on their self-autonomy. We tell you this is the problem with mercenaries in itself. So before I move on to my views, I'd like to start with the principal inconsistencies and inherent problems in your case. Firstly, um, as I stated earlier, they admit that they make decisions of self-autonomy. So if this is so, it's more likely that they kill civilians. Secondly, first, their first speaker came up and told us that oh, mercenaries won't be paid. It's completely voluntary, okay? But then, they, then they, their justification as to why mercenaries wouldn't kill civilians is because of the revenue, because of the profit. So if they're not getting money, how in what way are they incentivized not to kill civilians? Because if they're not getting money from the governmental body, if they're not getting money from the UN, they are in no way incentivized to not kill civilians. 
Thirdly, I think they, they do not really understand the purpose of the UN and the foundations that they have been built on. Because the purpose of the UN is, as I've stated in my speech, is that they are they are trying to solve oppression in the world. They are trying to solve problems in the world in the most peaceful way possible. But when you do this, it goes against the very thing that the UN stands for, which is peace. Because you're fighting violence with violence, and that is never the answer, as we have proved to you throughout the entire bridge. Also, they never engage with us on exactly how it's going to be so much worse when you intervene in the sovereignty of a country because the government will be angry and angry because you're intervening with the sovereignty of the country. So they never engage on exactly how the government won't oppress these people even more, won't be even more violent to these people simply because of what the UN are doing by intervening with people guns, uh, with guns raising and basically saying to the dictator and the government of the country, hey, look, I'm going to kill you, I'm coming to kill you. So we tell you this is even worse under their side. So now I would like to move on to my first issue, which is who exactly solves the problem more, right? Because this is the main uh, the main issue in this debate, whereby who solves the problem of oppression and so on better and who does not harm civilians at the end of the day. So what do mercenaries do? Mercenaries are money incentivized. They have no personal attachment to the citizens. So in that in itself shows you that they have no uh, incentivization to actually save the civilians and make sure they safeguard the civilians' lives. Also, they they will harm civilians. We've already proved to you throughout the entire bench that they will harm civilians simply because they don't have the incentive to save their country. And they also have not been trained by people who have been trained to save their country. The military is so much better simply because they are trained and their primary goal, no matter what, regardless of whether or not they do the job, is to make sure no civilians are killed. And this is the yeah. thing that we've been fighting for, and this is the thing we tell you is so important, right? Because the military are highly trained. And we've already told you that our authority, we're going to improve their conditions, we're going to make it make it easier and better for the military to do this. They'll do the job and maintain peace, and they're also uh, better skilled in the sense that, that we stated also, they have been trained. So I already told you how we solve the problem all at the end of the day. I already identified all the principal inconsistencies and the inherent problems in the case. So for all these reasons, we take this debate. Thank you. The debate about mercenaries against military was a small portion of this debate. The larger picture that side opposition chose to hide away from was whether military or the military would be a part of this war in its existence. Because the characterization that we brought to you, Mr. Speaker, from the Prime Minister, is that the reason why we hire mercenaries is the reluctance of nations to send their military into war zone. The reluctance of nations to try to save citizens of other descent for their own economic gain. The reluctance of nations to vote, to intervene by means of another army because they can. That is why we hire mercenaries. Because it's not a question of whether the military is capable, it is a question of whether the military will be there in that war zone. And we said we can't take that risk. We can't take the risk of the US being the only country there, the only country being the imperialist, being painted as the Western ideology, be implemented in an Islamic state. That is something that they chose to ignore. So there are two questions in this debate, which will prove why we won. One, are mercenaries accountable? Two, what are the alternatives to their side? So first, are mercenaries accountable? We need to prove the misrepresentation that came from opposition. We told that mercenaries are voluntary. The definition of being voluntary is that these are people who are not forced into a war zone. Meaning, considering they are voluntary, there is less of a reluctance to execute full-fledged policies. Meaning, so the US is reluctant to carry out policies because they know that ISIS captured their own soldiers. That is the point of being voluntary. The second misrepresentation is this idea of being funded. Blackwater is self-funded. We don't need to fund Blackwater. The Peshmerga is funded by the FSC. The definition of being funded is that they have the ability to execute these policies and have the ability to execute these military interventions. Hereby, we don't need to fund them with weapons. We don't need to fund them with explosives. The only thing we do is pay them to execute these policies. We pay them if these policies work out as well. So clearing that up, are mercenaries 
yes, mercenaries are money minded. That's as far as we'll go to side opposition. Considering that they are money minded, they are also a subjected to the same laws as soldiers. They are subjected to the same mistakes as soldiers, and they are subjected to the same emotions as soldiers within wars. Because a, even if that's not enough, if a, if a mercenary does fulfill the goal but does harm a citizen, we will still prosecute them. I don't see why we will pay this mercenary group if they end up harming thousands of citizens and thousands of human lives. That's illogical. But even if that wasn't enough, they simply won't do that, Mr. Speaker, because they know they will lose their profit and they will lose their money. They try to swindle this. They try to say, if I kill that person and I kill a million citizens before I reach him, I will still get my money. That's not what he told you. What we told you was, as long as you achieve that goal and you step within the same legal boundaries as every other soldier, that is when a mercenary group will be paid. A mercenary group will not be tolerated if they harm civilians. They will be treated the same as individuals who perpetuate war crimes. This was the last hanging fruit from side opposition because they, they gave up ground and everything else. The last thing they wanted to tell us was they were harm civilians. Well, the last response is even if it does happen, even if crossfire does happen, it is still a better alternative than your side. Where is your military in Iran? Where is your military in Rwanda? It does not exist. Individuals are oppressed in these areas and we cannot help them. So second, what are the alternatives? They told us the US is peaceful. Incorrect. The US does use interventions. It's just rejected more often than not. Peace will not work. We told you peace will not work, and they haven't contended it. So given that peace will not work, we did not see an alternative from side opposition. The military might be effective. We will not challenge that. But the military, more often than not, will not be there in the battleground. Who do you then employ? <laughs> Uh, we want to block it at this end. Okay. Yeah.